Ambassador Booth, thank you for coming this morning. Um, we're very happy to have you here uh, today to talk about um, the current issues going on in Sudan and South Sudan. Um, and so uh, please feel free to start with any introductory remarks and then we'll take some questions. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I just want to make a few uh, remarks uh, in terms of U.S. Uh, policy on South Sudan. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to just reiterate that our main concern is that of the South Sudanese people. Uh, and that's why we have been the, the major donor of humanitarian assistance and prior to the conflict, a major development as assistance partner. Uh, that's why we have been so involved in the peace process uh, that was mediated by EGAD uh, and why we have been uh, trying so hard to uh, help the South Sudanese to actually implement the peace agreement. Uh, now that there has been uh, fighting and uh, in Juba in July, uh, we're focused on trying to restore uh, peace and stability in South Sudan. Uh, our focus is uh, on particularly restoring enough stability in Juba so that um, the people of the city can feel safe, so that the international partners can continue to operate uh, and provide the assistance that the people of South Sudan need. Uh, we also believe that uh, uh, the deployment of the Regional Protection Force uh, that the United Nations Security Council approved uh, last month uh, will be critical uh, to uh, stabilizing the situation and opening the possibility for a broader political process uh, so that the country does not descend again into uh, conflict. Mm -hmm. Is that all you want to say sort of in terms of the remarks? Sure. Okay, great. So can I draw a little curtain around that and just sort of do a little Q&A with you. Let me just get this thing that I want to make sure that my questions are exactly as Tanzan wanted me to ask. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I just... So, um, this is just a formality, if you forgive me. Just give me your name and your title as you wish to be introduced. Yes, I'm Donald Booth. I'm a President Special Envoy to Sudan and South Sudan. Okay, the first question is about uh, the former first vice president, Makar, is that him? Mashar. Mashar. Mm -hmm. The former first, the, uh, Rick, is concerning Rick Mashar, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what is his relevance now that he's absent? Of course, you know, he's been gone for a little while now. What do you think his, his stake in the game is at this point in terms of helping the situation or not? Well, the, uh, we're not taking a position on uh, the leadership of the SPLM in opposition. Uh, that's a matter for the SPLM in opposition to decide. Um, Riek Machar has uh, left South Sudan, uh, and uh, he still obviously has many followers, um, including here in the diaspora in the United States. Um, what we're trying to aim for is that it's not only uh, one person that, that matters in trying to bring peace to South Sudan. It's bringing all of those who are representing people who have been wronged, who have grievances, who want to have a role in trying to build a country that can live together in peace. That's what we want to see, uh, those people be able to come together uh, and, and, and find a way to work together. Uh, the attempt in the peace agreement uh, to bring the opposition, known as the I.O., uh, led by Riek Mashar at the time, um, and uh, the government uh, of the day, led by Salva Kiir, uh, to bring them together with a couple of others uh, from other political parties uh, and other members of the SPLM, uh, the main uh, party, uh, to come together as a government of national unity. Um, unfortunately, uh, because uh, of security uh, forces that were there, uh, as protection for uh, Riek Mashar and for President Kiir, uh, they got into a firefight on the 9th of July, uh, and then that escalated, um, or on the 8th of July, and that escalated subsequently on the, the 10th and 11th, which resulted in uh, Riek Mashar being driven out of, out of Juba. Mm -hmm. The critical thing is that uh, the various voices that represent the constituencies, the ethnic constituencies, the political constituencies, uh, the religious constituencies in South Sudan have a way to come together to plot a future uh, for the country. And as I said in my testimony uh, before the Congress, um, we don't believe it was wise for Riek Mashar to return to Juba, uh, and, but we also don't think that that's an excuse for Salva Kiir to consolidate power. Uh, 
it's not wise for Riek Machar to go back to Juba, uh, just from a practical perspective. Uh, his safety and, and how that could be guaranteed. Um, and if he were to go back again uh, with the security forces that he went there with after the peace agreement, uh, we've seen the result of that. And none of us want to see uh, another battle in the streets of Juba. Tell me a little bit about, um, you talk about getting people around the table and all these different stakeholders. How do you do that? I mean, what is sort of the American strategy for how to bring peace and stability to the place, uh, including this idea of, of sort of sitting around the table and coffee and working it out? Well, that's really for the South Sudanese to decide how they want to, to come together to figure this out. Uh, we don't have any magic formula for them on that. Uh, they have to uh, they have to be the ones that figure out how they're going to start talking to each other again and stop fighting each other. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're encouraging. And all what we're focused on right now is trying to get the regional protection force, which was approved by the UN Security Council last month, uh, to Juba so that there is a, a stability and a security uh, uh, so that they can begin to, to think through how they're going to do this. Could you tell me, uh, and forgive it if this is a simplistic question, but what is the American interest in this, uh, in this conflict? I mean, why is it such a priority that there be peace there particularly? Why should we care? Well, the United States uh, was one of the uh, major supporters of the right of South Sudanese to self-determination. Uh, we supported them in that effort. We were uh, behind the uh, Comprehensive Peace Agreement of 2005, which led to the referendum uh, and their vote for independence. And as the world's youngest country, uh, we felt um, uh, that we should be supporting what we had helped uh, to bring into being by supporting their struggle for self-determination. Uh, but more importantly, uh, as I said, we are uh, a friend of the people of South Sudan. And so we want to see an end to this conflict, to see an end to their suffering, and to see that they will have a better future. Uh, we would not want to see South Sudan go the way of other countries where governance uh, has collapsed um, and where people have been subjected to, uh, to endless uh, rounds of fighting. So it's really a, a humanitarian uh, uh, interest in the people of South Sudan uh, that has us engaged in trying to bring peace back to that country. In a practical sense, what does your day do they work involve, you personally? I mean, are you on the phone to, to ministers or, or diplomats? Are you talking to people sort of kind of in quiet ways? Uh, what, tell me a little bit about your job. Well, the work of the envoy is actually to be out there uh, meeting and talking uh, with all of the relevant players. Uh, so I do uh, visit Juba from time to time, but we have an ambassador, a uh, very capable ambassador in Juba, whose primary role is to engage with the government on the bilateral relationship. Uh, my role uh, had been during the peace negotiations. I was there uh, working uh, in support of the mediation team uh, and, and uh, providing ideas and talking to the parties and encouraging the compromises needed to achieve peace. Uh, after the uh, peace agreement was signed, working again with the region to resolve issues, uh, for example, security issues in Juba that needed further negotiation. Uh, and now that we've gone into this period uh, of the fighting in July and uh, uh, this, this uncertainty that exists now about the future, uh, again, uh, engaging with uh, regional leaders um, and as well as other key international partners. Uh, from uh, Europe to China to the United Nations, the African Union, uh, all of whom have a role, a key role to play um, in, in, in working with us, uh, working together to, uh, uh, to prevent instability from uh, spreading in South Sudan and to trying to restore uh, hope for their people for a peaceful future. Okay, last question, um, and I want to make sure I phrase this properly. How much, in your opinion, how much support uh, does the U.S. plan for an arms embargo actually have? And if it fails, uh, which we hope it doesn't, um, what do you think the plan B might be? Well, we've been clear that uh, we have uh, proposed an arms embargo uh, in the resolution uh, 2304, uh, that if the regional protection force is not uh, deployed, if there is obstruction of that, um, that we would uh, press for the Security Council to consider an arms embargo and perhaps other, other measures. 
uh, to try to pressure the parties to uh, to ex to accept the, the regional protection force, which we see again is key to restoring peace and stability in Juba, and opening space uh, for South Sudanese to uh, to figure out their future in a, in a peaceful path rather than a, a violent one. But if the embargo does not obtain or you don't get that resolution, what then? Well, uh, we will work very hard uh, if we decide that. Uh, the regional protection force uh, is being blocked. Uh, we will work very hard to make sure that uh, uh, that we have the uh, uh, the outcomes in the Security Council we're we're looking for. You sound hopeful a little bit. Uh, we're always optimistic. All right. Thank you. That's my interview. Hello, you mm -hmm. oh, hi. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, Abdullahi with the Pan African News Agency. Um, my question has to do with Sudan. Uh, recently, you were there to post uh, your work and uh, also ensure peace and stability, mostly in Darfur. But after your consultation, some of the parties you met were arrested by the intelligence officers there in Sudan. So what effort have you done to see to this and to this uh, was the, uh, harassment, I would call it? of the parties you've been meeting or having dialogue with? Uh, yes, I did uh, uh, do a three-day visit uh, uh, to Darfur um, recently and uh, had the uh, opportunity to go out and visit uh, some of the uh, uh, IDP camps uh, that were very close to the uh, Jebel Mara areas of, of, of conflict. Uh, met with a number of uh, representatives of the IDPs. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I learned uh, shortly after my visit that uh, some of those people uh, had been detained and questioned. Um, we understand that uh, they were part of a larger group uh, that was detained. Uh, and we have uh, expressed our great displeasure with the government um, that people who uh, come to talk with, uh, with, with me or with with, with anyone who's trying to understand the, the situation on the ground in Darfur, uh, that they should not be harassed for doing that. Uh, we understand that most of those uh, who were detained have now been released, but not all. And we're continuing to engage the government of Sudan uh, to try to um, ensure that they are, uh, they are released. Just yesterday, the, one of the Sudanese authorities or officials spoke about uh, re-engagement between the U.S. and the Sudanese government. But the main point of contention, he said, is about the sanctions, that if really U.S. want to re-engage with uh, Sudan again, they are calling for an end to the sanctions. So what efforts is being done to see to this end to sanctions in Sudan? Well, we have uh, uh, a, a regular uh, and, and increasingly robust uh, engagement and dialogue with, with Sudan on a whole range of issues. Uh, obviously, sanctions is one of the things that uh, they want to discuss, um, just as we uh, are equally uh, interested in discussing how uh, there can be an end to the conflicts uh, that continue in Sudan, in particular the conflicts uh, in the two areas of southern Kordofan and Blue Nile states uh, and in Darfur. Um, and so there are a range of issues beyond beyond that uh, as well that we uh, we discuss and, and try to uh, reach some understandings on, uh, and we will continue to uh, to engage uh, to see if we can achieve the outcomes that we would like to see in Sudan, just as they uh, will continue to engage with us to see outcomes that they would like, such as sanctions relief. Now to South Sudan, the issue as I learned from some people, because I've been to South Sudan and Sudan, is that the main issue upon com uh, contention in South Sudan is the leadership or the political class. So what advice are you for this leadership uh, or the leaders in South Sudan in order to bring peace and stability to that uh, young state? Well, this conflict um, that South Sudan has been enduring since December of 2013 is a man-made conflict. Uh, it's a man-made humanitarian disaster. Uh, and it has to do with the uh, leadership struggle uh, within the dominant uh, political organization, the uh, SPLM. 
and we have urged uh, since even before the outbreak of conflict that there needs to be a peaceful competition, political competition, uh, that resort to violence is there's, – there's no military solution to the, the political differences that exist. Um, and we call on all of the leaders of South Sudan uh, to put the interests of their people first and to focus on building their country uh, rather than trying to decide who gets a bigger piece. I think we need to, uh, to put aside personal uh, differences, uh, personal uh, ambitions, and, uh, and focus on uh, the interests of the people. Thank you. Any last question? No? Okay. Thank you, Master Boo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.